Hey, would y'all stand with us this morning? On God's celestial shore, I'll fly away. Go to somebody and tell them you love them in Jesus' name. for just a moment. Thank you so much for being here today and great to see each and every one of you. Appreciate you taking time to be here. Uh, it's always an honor and privilege to be in the house that we claim that here that we worship our Lord and Savior as a corporate body of, of believers and uh, man we are thankful that you are here today. If you got just a moment look in your worship guide. Um, I don't think we need any any announcement or introduction or information about what's going on starting tomorrow <laughs> up here on the stage uh, is the decorations for VBS this week we are looking forward to a great time with these kiddos but you see the information there uh, up on the screen I believe it is yes there it is make sure you read through that we start dinner at 5 and then VBS uh, around 5.45 uh, to around 8.30. But we want to encourage you, uh, invite your friends, neighbors. Uh, throughout the week, you may have somebody that God puts on your heart and mind. But looking forward to that, right after the service, Miss Heather needs to meet with us. Where would you want us to Right here, right here, right after the uh, 
uh, right after the service, meet down here front for a quick, brief meeting. And um, But I, I, I pray and ask that you pray for us this coming week and pray for these leaders and these children. I understand, I totally understand that it is a yearly and annual event. But lives are at stake, uh, souls are at stake, and uh, just as like what I'm going to be preaching on today, the reality of hell, and um, it started last week, but folks, it's a matter of eternity. So sometime this week, if you are not here or during the day, I ask, if during the day, is please, please pray uh, for this week with these special, awesome children that are going to be here. Also, you notice that if you got, we passed out these Promises baby bottles last week. Uh, we'll be picking those up next Sunday with it being Father's Day. I encourage you, you do not want to miss this coming uh, Sunday as well <coughs> with Father's Day. Going to be a great day as always. Uh, so, But those bottles are due. And then our youth will be leaving right uh, that ne the next day uh, for youth camp. So we want to continue to lift them up. And uh, I know they're going to have a great, I know they're going to have a great time. So it'll be, a, it'll be a something to do. But look on the back for a moment. Look on the back of your worship guide down at the bottom. It lists different aspects of our Wednesday nights. Uh, it will not be long before, we, before we're back in our fall routine, but uh, we want to have a good time this summer. But you see there different aspects of our, our Wednesday nights that are coming up. So um, we want to have a good time. We certainly want to lift up the Lord and enjoy our summer, but, uh, but I know the Lord's going to be faithful and um, we're gonna, we're gonna, we learn a lot, but we also get to experience a lot of neat things. So anyway, I want to tell you, church family, you are loved tremendously. If you're a guest with, with us here today, this church family will love you into its family. I can assure you of that. And um, if you're a guest with us, there should be in the pew in front of you a Connect card. Or please uh, leave some information about yourself so that we can have a record of your attendance we're not wanting to hound you or anything like that, but, you know, it, it, it really hurts us if we find out a message like, well, you know what, the, the pastor or preacher or the, or the staff never contacted us. We went and visited that church, and, and, uh, but we never were contacted. So I hope that you will please fill that out. We want you to know this is a place where you find faith, family, and friends. So thank you very much. For being here today, I'm going to ask our men if they be making their way forward as we take up our as we take up our morning offering. Uh, as they as they are coming down, it's it's a great a great weekend for my wife and I. We have both of our boys with us this All this right. time, and um, I'm grateful that Cy and Eli are here. Cy turns 27 <laughs> tomorrow, so anyway, and and if we I, I, I've already decided. Um, you know, one day that God willing that they ever find a wife, I'm going to give them an extra five hundred dollars uh, if we can just find a wife for them. So, um, we anyway. So we're going to do that, and and you know, <laughs> you, you'll pitch in on that. We'll just so hey, double it, or <laughs> double it or nothing. That's right. But no, seriously, we are grateful for our boys. <laughs> I wish they had more time so you could get to know them, but. Um, but anyway, they're here. We're glad that they're here today. We love them very much, of course, and uh, so we're grateful for that. Lord, thank you, God, for this day as we take up our morning offering. God, thank you for that we're able to be here. We ask God for your grace and mercy upon this service today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> Slain for 
the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Before you and God, we thank you that we can give back to you what you already own. God, just thank you so much that we can come in this place and worship. God, these tithes and offerings we consecrate to you. We thank you, God. You have been so gracious to us. Lord, we have given, we are continuing to give more than ever before in 2024. And God, again, I pray that we'll be continue to be committed to our, our commitment this whole year that we've already begun. And God, you have blessed us incredibly. And Lord, just when the aspect of giving shows, it shows where we are in our relationship with you because we are never more like you than when we give or when we serve. So God, I give you all the honor and glory and praise. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a round of clap for our offering this morning. Ask our children to be making their way. They can be headed out to, to the kids' zone. Man, always grateful for our, these awesome children. I'm glad they look forward to being here and enjoying this time. So, <laughs> man, what a special time. Special, special time. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on. The roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me.
song has been on my mind kind of all week and it's our opportunity just like we sort of took a second in praise team practice to just stop and I know we all got a lot of things going on but I want you to just if you can for a moment I want you to just let all that other stuff go and I want us to just focus on God for just a minute focus on the presence of God the power of God Maybe some of you have never heard that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Maybe some of you are walking in that purpose, and you're walking boldly in it, but you want to go deeper with God. I want you to take this time. These altars are open. If you feel led, I want you to come down to the altar and meet with God. But I, Whatever you got to do right now to just dive into God's presence, I want you to just soak it in right now. Soak in God's presence. God, we just thank you. We're caught up in your presence, God. And I want to, I want to interact with your presence because that's worship. Caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Ooh. oh I'm not here for blessings Jesus you don't know me anything more than anything Sing it out with us. I'm caught up in your presence. Whoa. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to be. I want us to, I want to ask us something while Jim is is leading that song is something special but I want us if you don't mind during this offer during this time of the altar you know I, I, we can't pray enough for VBS um, I want us to pray for that I, I must say I covet your prayers as I preach this morning I need prayer I, I, I need prayer when you speak on this type of subject you know it's very heavy and and it's reality and um, so I, I need, I, I'm asking by God's grace that um, you feel led to come here at the altar. I just encourage us to pray for that. We want to continue to pray for our church, that God, God is, definitely going, is definitely up in, a, in, the, in the right, getting us in position to do something, I believe, incredible. So I want to just add, and you can pray for our nation, pray for our country. But right now, I'm going to ask is Jim, as they sing this next verse, join us down here at the altar. And let's pray for those several things. And also, one other thing is to, like Jim said, to prepare, to prepare our hearts as we worship God and to receive his word. So there are several things that I want to encourage you to pray. So God willing, you come. Let's pray. Jim, you sing. Man, what a special time of worship. But let's go to the Lord in prayer, too, for those, for what we got coming up. So let's pray.
just sit in your presence and God we're thankful for your grace and your mercy where would we be without your grace and mercy every one of us have encountered the need for your grace or your mercy at some point in our life and God to be a Christian we must come face to face with your grace and your mercy and somehow God you forgive us and you cleanse us you said that if we would ask you would cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness and so, God, we just sit here in your presence. As Brother Guy comes this morning, God, I pray that you would empower him. I pray that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit. That, that there would be a clarity and a freshness. And that there would be revelation power. That's coming from him. And God, in each of our hearts... I pray, pray that you would prep each of our hearts to receive your word as we sit in your presence this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. You may be seated. I just, right there, if you would just, if you would just close your eyes, bow your head. You know, I have a, both my wife and I have a saying that, um, 
we say something like this. Have I told you today that I love you? You know, I can't but help but think that it would honor the Lord today if we could just simply tell the Lord, hey, Lord, have I told you today already on this day that you've allowed me to live, that allowed me to have the breath that I have and the food that we've been able to eat and the food we will eat or whatever, we, we've been blessed. Lord, have I told you thank you and that I love you today? So right there, just in this moment, as that wonderful train comes right through the service, <laughs> Hey, praise the Lord. But just tell him, say, Lord, have I told you today that I love you? that verse says I just want you as a prayer also before we preach before I preach and before just tell the Lord Lord all I want is just you mm. precious holy name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. What an honor it is to be able to open God's Word today. And um, boy, what a sweet time. I tell you, I don't know how to explain this, the, the sense and the presence of God's Spirit when you stand behind this pulpit. Some of you know because you've given testimony. Now, I know that this is just a gla piece of glass and uh, whatever to make, a, to make a podium or whatever, but there's something sacred about this place just where you are too, but this place right here. And I, like I said, I covet your prayers always. To stand behind this, this place is a big responsibility because I just know that I, I don't want ever to be, and by God's grace, however he does it, but I'm telling you, I don't want to be standing behind this pulpit with the Lord angry at me. <laughs> or not angry, but you know what I mean. I mean. Just like if I've done something, Lord, have mercy on me. I want to come clean before the Lord, and I just think that's the posture that we all take when we come into his presence, that we take that posture of humility and cry out to him and tell him that you love him and and lord thank him thank him as jim sang just a moment ago about god's grace thank you for his grace or said thank you for his grace and mercy it's it's just so overwhelming so overwhelming but um anyway if you got a copy of your of, of god's word i want to invite you to take it go back to luke chapter 16 we're going to finish up today on this it, this hot topic that we have it's hot but it's hotter in hell. <laughs> I said last week as we broke into this message that there are, there are many phrases that, that people use the word H-E-L-L in. And um, I always giggle or laugh when I, when I hear, and you, you hear it, not because you may intentionally want to hear it. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But somebody somewhere in your workplace or on TV, they'll make a comment that it's, that it's hot as, you know, the 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 word there and and i don't i don't want to say that in a, a derogatory way i'm not saying i just want you to know that that's how that phrase is used but jesus did talk about hell and as i said last week it is a proven fact when you search the scriptures that he talked more about hell than he did heaven and he talked about hell more than more than a lot of other things too but he but he he gave us bluntly and carefully, his 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 uh, the word the, the the place called hell for a reason, because because in God's great mercy there is the place called heaven. And when Jesus was on the cross, when Jesus was on the cross, and he hung there, and that and that uh, criminal that was that was next to him, and the and the criminal on the other side, one of them mocked him, and the other one said, "Jesus, remember me when you enter your 
your kingdom. And, and God said, Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. And so Jesus gave a promise to those that when we trust him and we know him as our Lord and Savior, when we leave this earth, we're going somewhere. And by the way, it is, a, it is an eternal destiny, an eternal destiny in heaven or in hell. And so as I begin this today, I just want to begin with a couple of comments. And then I'm going to, we, we, we basically got through last week, uh, as far as my introduction, I gave you uh, New Testament words to describe hell. And um, there, there are basically four. And then I gave another one just as a terminology called the lake of fire found in Revelation. And, and how these different words, and, but right here in this passage though, Jesus talked about this through a parable and through a story that, that, that I believe is true. Um, I believe that Jesus there again making a point to his audience about what lies ahead for those who, who, who reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, reject Jesus uh, through his word, had, don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. We, you know, uh, as far as anyone who rejects him. In other words, that when someone is presented the truth of the gospel and no one is without excuse, no one is without excuse because in Psalm 19, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. So no one, no one has an excuse. There's not going to be anyone that kind of just slips into heaven, you know? It's not like, well, maybe God would just let me just barely get in. No, no, it's not barely. It's either or. It's, it's not something that we, that we just say, you know, I, all right, God, remember all the good that I've done. That ought to get me into heaven. That's not how it works. And God was very, the, and Jesus was very, very stern with that. And as you're going to see today, it's not, it's not God. It's not God who sends people to hell. You sin yourself, those who reject Christ. Even through that, we see the grace and long loving God that we have. But hell is, hell is a place, and um, hell is real. And if you think about it, if you think about this, uh, this statement here. If you believe that heaven is a real location, if we believe that heaven is a real location, you have to assume logically that hell is a real location as well. You have to because we because it's, it's not like, see, folks believe in a number of things outside of Christianity, outside the Bible, that hell is a state of mind. That when they die, it's just a state of mind that I'm living in hell, a state of mind that, that, that it has no, there's, no, there's no physicality to it, there's no, there's no real place, it's all made up. It's, and then you, you see the other side about people, people saying different aspects of, hey man, come join me in hell, hell's going to be a party. And, and then you have this thing called annihilation. That that you know we're gonna people are that are in, in hell are gonna experience annihilation that they're gonna be totally wiped out and they they won't have to go through the pain and suffering that when God throws them into the lake of fire and you hear that terminology that somehow they're gonna be annihilated and I just don't think the word of God teaches that even though. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish. That word perish also, it's, 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 sort, of like, it's sort of like this. It's, like, it's not like an, at an instant where you immediately, immediately perish and you're, you're annihilated. But the word used there has more like something like this. If I were to, if I were to say that the sun, the sun has put a scorching heat on my deck in my backyard, and because of that, it is fading away. In other words, that if I say that deck is perishing, if you'll notice that deck, if that deck, the sun has scorched it, but it's over a process of time. And so I firmly believe that, that as what the Bible teaches, that yes, we, the people will perish, but it's not annihilation. It is a continuous fading away 
of, of living in hell, and the Bible describes hell as eternity. So when we hear those things and hear those words, there are those that use that such thing as John 3, 16 as something about those are going to be annihilated. But there again, I ask you simply logically to think, why would we get to live forever by God's grace and then those that have, have chosen to re- reject Jesus not get to experience all of hell and give them an excuse to, to just take their lives away. So anyway, as we jump into this, I have to say that, not, that if you believe heaven is a real location, you have to assume logically that hell is a location. But let's look at Luke 16, Jesus here. I gave you last Sunday, and I believe you have in your worship guide, verses, scriptures there, along with the notes, along with the outline that I'm going to finish today. You have passages of scripture there that back up the different words that Jesus used and words that were used uh, in, the, in the New Testament that refer and one in the Old Testament to hell. So as I read this, let's read this together. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. There, is, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22, the time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, and there is one of the words that Jesus used to describe, where... He was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far, far away with Lazarus by his side. Now, I want you to notice something in verse 22. The Bible says there, it says, the time came when the beggar died. Do you know there's going to come a time when you die? There is going to come a time where you die physically. And not only do you die physically... There, is a, there, there are those that prayerfully that when we leave here today that all of us know that for sure that if we die today that we go to heaven. But the time will come that when we will all die, unless Jesus decides to come back before them, we all have an, an, an appointment with death. And when you, when you die without Christ, you die a second death. Not only do you die physically, but you die spiritually because inside of us, God created a soul inside of us that will live on forever and ever. And so when we die, there's going to be a time where we face death. But anyway, it goes on, and he says, So he called to him, Father Abraham, verse 24, Have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire or flame but abraham replied son remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and lazarus received the bad things but now he is comforted here and you are in agony and besides all this between us and you a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Wow. What a strong word that Jesus has said right here. So I want to just go through for just a moment a couple of comments, and then I want to give you the, 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 the five aspects of this deal about hell is hot. You know, Jesus described hell as a place of burning sulfur, and those in it experience eternal, unspeakable agony of an unrelenting nature. Matter of fact, when Jesus used the word Gehenna in other places, there's another word for hell, was Gehenna, we talked about that, and in Revelation that word is used as well as lake of fire. It was a designated valley as as far as the, the physical location. It was a designated valley south of Jerusalem, and it was a repulsive place where trash and refuse were burned. And we looked at last week, if you remember Jeremiah 731, it was where uh, it was where children were sacrificed. And it was where criminals were taken after they were they were killed and they were put in this place. And could you imagine the stench and the and the and the flame 
the fire that, that, were, that were consumed in that, it, gave, it gives a picture about what hell is going to be like, a place of burning sulfur. And those who have rejected Christ are in, <clears throat> are in that temporary uh, uh, place of the dead in Hades and Sheol, and they certainly one day will be thrown into that lake of fire as their final destination. And I mentioned that last week. We are not in a holding pattern when we die. We go into the pre- as a believer, we go into the presence of God. If those who aren't a believer go to a place of torment, a place of agony. And as you see here, as you see here, you see what the rich man went through. But later on, when you look at Revelation, there's going to come another time where this Revelation describes that the beast, Satan, and those names who were not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. So the bottom line is this. You don't get to decide after this life where you go. You have to decide. We know this. We have to decide on this side of life where we will spend eternity. And no matter what someone says out there in the, real, in the world, excuse me, in the, in the world or maybe in churches and maybe I don't know where pastors probably don't ever teach on hell, we live in a day where there's a lot of softness in preaching, um, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of make you feel good. And uh, the only thing I can tell you that's going to make you feel good is if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen. I mean, the only thing that's going to make us feel good if, you know, uh, is, is, is knowing that Christ is our Lord and Savior and that not just for fire insurance that we have a relationship with him, but, but for this instance, since we're talking about it, praise God for his grace and mercy. But what did Jesus say about hell? Like I said, Jesus frequently spoke about hell in his teachings using vivid imagery and strong language. And he warned his listeners about the danger of sin and unbelief. And here's a picture of someone, the rich man, around all of this. And Lazarus, you see the side of Lazarus in, in Abraham's bosom, in heaven, in God's presence. And we see that the, 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 the danger of unbelief versus the, the promise of belief between these two. But a couple of ob- observations in this passage before I get to the outline and then we're done, okay? But if you look at, go back, go back to the pa- go back to our passage, and I want you to know this. Let me ask you a question because it says there was a rich man, there was a beggar named Lazarus. The time came in verse twenty-two when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. So there was a physical location, and then the rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham. Obviously, let me ask you this: Were they conscious? conscious in the place where they were absolutely they were isn't it amazing that in hell the rich man the bible says here that this man was conscious same way was abraham same way with with lazarus they both were conscious now can you imagine being conscious in everlasting flames or torment how many of you would be honest to say that you don't have a really big tolerance of pain? Would you raise your hand? That's right. We don't like pain. Even if you do have a tolerance of pain, it's not going to ever measure up to what this guy went through and those that don't, don't know Christ. The Bible says, as we've said, he was in agony in this fire. So they were, they were conscious Both men, as I said, were alive after death. One man was in torment, the other was in peace. They both recognized Abraham. And by the way, here's another aspect just off the top of reading this. Think about this. Did the rich man in hell have all of his five senses? Yes, he did. He sure did. And didn't, uh, uh, obviously, Lazarus, also had, had the five senses too. I just, I just noticed this. What, what do you mean, brother guy? Well, he had, he had sight. He had sight, right? He could see. The Bible says that he could see Father Abraham. He could see Lazarus. Obviously, also, is, is they, they, um, they, they both recognized Abraham. And not only did he have sight, let me ask you this. 
Didn't he have feeling? Didn't he have touch? Absolutely. The Bible says, let him come and dip the tip of his finger because I am in agony in this fire. Not only was sight and touch, but he, but he bound to have taste, right? <laughs> he bound because he, he knew water would cool his tongue. So obviously we see from this passage that, that you know, you are, you are still alive in, your, in a way, but you're separated from God and you're in torment versus Lazarus because of Jesus and because Jesus sharing here the opposite of the rich man is what the Lazarus was there in heaven. I mean, we're going to be able to see, praise God, because we're going to see Jesus. I believe that, you know, we're going to have new bodies, and, and I can't describe all that, but I know this, we're going to be able to speak, right? Not only are we going to be able to see, but we're going to be able to speak. What, what do you think we're going to be saying in heaven, you know? The Bible gives us in John what we're going to be doing. The Bible says already that they're bowing on their knees and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. So they're going to sing. And you know what? We're going to be able to hear. Believe that. And I, don't, I can't explain it. We're not going to just be some, some, little, <laughs> some little alien up there. You know? we're, going to, we're going to be able to hear how all that transpires. I'm glad God has it and not me. What about hearing? What about hearing? Well, obviously, you see the conversation here in this passage where, but Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime? So obviously, there was a conversation. Now, I don't know about this, and I don't want to get too much into this, but, I, I, you know, I don't know if we're going to be able to, you know, when we get to heaven and, and we're going to be able to see lost people in hell, I, I, you know, I just know that we're going to be there and, and those that don't know Christ are going to be there. But, but, but could it be? Could it be just like this man called this rich man noticed that it was too late and was able somehow to see into the peace and the presence of Almighty God and talk and say, hey, can I not come over there? Well, it's best not to find out after the fact than it is before the fact. <laughs> But obviously we see conversation here. Not only that, there was a great chasm between both that you could not cross over from heaven, or excuse me, from hell, Haiti, from torment to peace. My dear friend, Jesus talked about that. And he gives more, he gives, he's given us more and more warning concerning that. That there is a great chasm. So, let me finish this up. Number one is this. You already probably got the first one. Hell is a physical place. Hell is an actual place. It is an eternal place of the unsaved. There, is no, there will be no Christians in hell. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. It's just like there will be no lost person in heaven. You will be saved. People that know Christ, they are saved people. So, hell is is a physical, physical, and actual place. Number two is this. Hell is a physical place of torment. Again, I said in verse 24, So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger. To dip the tip of his finger. Into, so that I, I'm no longer in agony, or because I'm in agony in this fire. Turn for just a moment over to Revelation chapter 20, please. Take your Bible and flip over to, uh, excuse me, Revelation. Did I say Romans? Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Again, a physical place of torment. A physical place of torment. In chapter 20, verse 10, we see, And the devil... And the devil deceived them and was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the prophet, false prophet, had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. So hell is a place of physical torment. Number three is this. Not only is it a place of physical torment, an actual place, but number three, hell is a place, listen, is a place of loneliness. 
Matthew 8, 12 describes hell as a place of indescribable loneliness. You know, you, you, you hate to see, you know, obviously in this passage that the rich man is not the only one that's going to be in hell. But in this passage, did you notice that he didn't have anybody to comfort him? The rich man didn't have anyone in hell to say, hey, you're going to be okay. The rich man, he was in agony because of that fire. But also, I want you to notice, did you, did you notice that, that, that Lazarus was in the presence of Almighty God? It says Father Abraham. In Father Abraham's bosom, obviously the place of peace and, and place of, of glory and, and, and how all that transpires again. You know, we're going to be in the presence of Almighty God. That's what that means. We're going to be in the, God, in the presence of Jesus. And you know what? There's no loneliness in heaven. <laughs> and my, question, my, my statement to you is, don't go there. <laughs> don't go there. You don't have to be there. People on this earth feel or have places of loneliness. And there are folks out there that are lonely. And you know what? When they're lonely, they're miserable. And because of that loneliness here on this earth, I think it's sort of a picture of what people, because when people get to a stage where they're lonely and in depression and all of that, it is, it is, it is indescribable pain. But hell is much worse than that. And can imagine to be that lonely without Jesus. So it's a lonely place. Indescribable loneliness. We don't like loneliness on this earth. We don't like to be alone. But hell is going to be a place of loneliness. Number, number four, I believe we're at. Hell is a place of deserved judgment. Hell is a place of deserved judgment. Again, he says there in verse 25, but Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received the bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And then in verse 27, it says this, And he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. And then in verse 29, it says, Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. You know what he was trying to do? He was obviously, he recognized that his family needed Jesus. And he obviously recognized that there was a coming judgment. And you know what? He, Abraham even said, look, they have Moses and the prophets. If, if they're not, listen, if they didn't believe Jesus when he rose again from the dead that he was alive, what good would it do if this man came back from the dead and said, look, I need you. Family, know Jesus. This place is agonizing. This place is, and you know what? There are people still looking for signs today. They, they want to say, I believe in God if I see a sign. Well, one day they're going to see a sign if they die without Christ. But it's going to be too late, right? Do you know you have around you people and friends and folks that do not know God, do not know Jesus, to have a relationship with him? That they are on a path, they are on a trail, they are a heartbeat away from eternal judgment. That's what this talks about here, a place of goodness, unrelenting judgment. And again, let me say this. Let me say this, no one, in hell, no one is in hell because of God's choice, but only their choice people choose who re choose to reject the truth of Jesus. It's not just God's choice. But Brother Guy says there in Revelation that he's going to throw everyone, in, uh, throw the ones who don't know him, and they're going to experience judgment. Absolutely, but guess what? Time, is not, time has not run out just yet for those of us who are here. You've been given grace after grace after grace after grace. You, you are given mercy. No one, again, no one, no, one, no one can blame but nobody but themselves when they experience this place called hell. But it is a place of deserved judgment. They will stand before God, just like at the great white throne judgment there in Revelation. The great white throne judgment there on this place of deserved judgment when jesus finally says god almighty finally says and he throws them into the lake of fire with the devil and with or excuse me satan and with the false prophet and the beast 
everything there and they will live there forever and ever. And at least the last thing is this, is that hell is a forever destination. Hell is a forever destination. He said there that there is a big chasm fixed so that you cannot cross over. Listen to this. Once you die, your eternal destination is just that. It is eternal. It is eternal. And they will be there forever and ever and ever and ever. And when you see that word forever and ever and ever, the same Greek word that is used there in Revelation as hell as being forever and ever and ever, it's the same word that's also used that we will be in glory and we will worship God, we will worship Jesus forever and forever and forever. Hallelujah. It is a forever destination. Eternity hangs in the balance, hangs in the balance of what you do with it. It is a forever destination. The story goes, H.A. Ironside told a story of pioneers who were making their way across one of the central states to a distant place that had, that had been opened up for homesteading. They traveled in covered wagons drawn by oxen and progressed was necessarily slow. <laughs> obviously, you know that going from east to west and through all the terrain and stuff, obviously slow. One day, they were horrified to note a long line of smoke in the west, stretching for miles across the prairie. And soon it was evident that the dried grass was burning fiercely and coming toward them rapidly. They had crossed already, they had already crossed over a river the day before, and it would be impossible to go back to that before the flames would catch up with them and burn them. One man only seemed to have an understanding as to what could be done. He gave the command to set fire to the grass behind them. Then when a space was burned over, the... Uh, the whole company moved back upon it. And as the flames roared on toward them from the west, a little girl cried out in terror, Are you sure we shall not all be burned up? Are you sure we won't be burned up? Here comes the fire. Why are we burning the grass here behind us? And the leader replied this, My child, my child, the flames cannot reach us here. For we are standing where the fire has already been. I want you to know that because of Jesus, that we will not have to stand in the fire because someone has already been there. And his name is Jesus. So where will you spend eternity today? If you were to die today, and tragically as it is, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not trying to manipulate anyone. I'm not going to do that. I'm not here to manipulate. I'm just here to tell the truth. But you know, recently, we, it just seems that every other, every other month, there's a tragic accident. And the first thing that pops in my mind, and I know, I know we, can't, we obviously can't touch everybody. One person can't touch everybody. But I always think, what was that person's destination? We all want to be able to say that person is in a better place, don't we? But that's not always the case. But it is always the case when we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Our praise team is on their way up here. And in just a moment, they're going to be singing a what we call, a, just basically call an invitation song. And I want to encourage you as you're there in your pew right there with you, or right there 
you know what? That's, this is between you and Jesus. The person on your right, the person on your left, they can't get you to heaven by themselves. It's a personal decision. In other words, I, I, I won't be able to get to heaven on my parents' credit. I won't be able to get to heaven on my wife's credit. I won't get to heaven on my children's credit. I won't get to heaven on anyone else's credit except Jesus. And so I just ask today, do you know for certain that if you were to die today that you would be in heaven? This is the time of invitation, a time for a response. But you know what? If we walk out of here, if we walk out of here, we make a decision. If we don't know Christ, we, we, we're making a decision. Not we're, 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 we're walking out and turning our backs on Jesus if we are not desiring to be saved. For those who do not know Jesus, those who have never been saved, those of you who are here who do not have a relationship with Christ, I encourage you, don't turn your back on Christ. Let today be the day of salvation. We can lead you to Christ. It's your decision. It's your choice. It's, your, it's, it's, it's in your hands. Like they say, the ball is in your court. And that's not a scary thing. That's just reality. Or maybe here today as a believer, you, you're here today, and God has spoken to you, and he's definitely massaged your heart that you know that maybe, maybe, you need to, maybe you need to get some things straight with God in your relationship. Oh, no, he's not going to cast you away. He's not ever going to leave you, forsake you. But, you know, when you hear a message about hell, and, you, and you, you, it just kind of humble. It, well, it does. It humbles you. Maybe you just need to come here at the altar and during this time just talk with God. Or maybe you're here today and, and you, you are a believer and you've never been scripturally baptized. You, you've been saved and you need to follow Christ in believer's baptism. Or maybe you're here today and God's leading you to be a part of this church. You've been visiting you for time and time again. You come, you're, you're awesome, you're a guest. And maybe today you, you are a believer in Christ. You've been scripturally baptized. And you know what? Maybe this is the place where you need to, where God is leading you. I encourage you to be obedient there as well. We'd love to have you. I'm not going to make you. Only God does that. God works in our heart. So whatever the decision is today, you be honest with God. Or as a believer here today, you know your final destination. Again, like I said earlier, did you tell him that you loved him? Have you told him? But let me ask you this. Have you thanked him for saving you? Hello? Have you thanked him today for saving you? Saving you from your sin. Saving you from death. From, he from hell, saving you because of his grace and mercy, because he loved you, that he went to the cross and died for you. Have you ever to have you told him that lately? So whatever the decision is, you come. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to stand. Father, in these brief moments that we have together, as we continue this sermon, um, excuse me, as we continue this service, Lord, may we, may we be obedient to you. God, we love you, we praise you. And even through this time, may you be honored in Jesus' name. Amen. Miss Heather's here. Patrick's here. I'm here at the front. You come on the very first note.